How is your progress, my boy? It would seem you're nearing the end of the manuscript. Yes, master. I've almost completed the entire copy. It's an exhaustive tome. You've done well, my boy. I know it has been an arduous journey, but, Master, why? Why must we write every word and every sound, every inclination, every strange prophecy that emanates from that cubic object? Much less copy it again and again to move the books in secret from library to library. Sometimes men being burned alive for defying our secret order. I fear that completing this tome, I've only... I've only wrapped myself further in the mystery. Something does not feel right, Master. Yes. Yes, my boy. Let me sit next to you here. Uh, There. It is time you learned the truth of your task as Scribner here in the Dark Tower. Never simple was your task, and never neutral in the war against good and evil. We represent a faction that strives only for balance between the two, and there is no source of knowledge greater than that object over there, as you call it. It has been our cruel and cold master for centuries now. But my old bones are as creaky as this wooden chair. And I will not be able to stand steward much longer. It is time I reveal the outcome of your arduous task, my boy. And it is not one more copy of the mainframe's chitterings. It is not another caravan across the Pine Ocean to take the manuscript to some hidden monastery, no. The book you have just created will likely burn or fall to rot in some hidden vault. I have had you do this. All four thousand pages, every illumination, every letter, so that you will have a mental command of the teachings of the mainframe. There will come a time when those with sword and shield and torch will bring our order to dust. But there will be survivors, and in our minds and our hearts it will live on. What, Master? What will live on? The RPG... (laughs) Mainframe. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That one got a little longer than usual. <laughs> and I think it forgot the squealing sound. <laughs> There we go. Now it's a podcast. Greetings programs. Your old buddy Ingrid Byrne all here. Coming back at you from the town of Barholm up in northern Runeham area with another Oppenheim episode of the RPG mainframe. This is where we do the deep think, not only on the hobby, but on the ways that our brains process this hobby and make it as glorious as it is. And on a more aspirational note, Make it as glorious as it can be. This is RPG Mainframe, episode 50. Oh, it's episode 50. Sweet mother, Aunt Petunia all put together. This is a jar of jam you're going to want on your toast. Hooey. So for episode 50, first of all, thank you everybody for even making this freaking possible couple of years back, all this was just a notion. Even the, the very invention of a Runehammer podcast, the RPG mainframe, wasn't really even my idea. It all came from you guys. It all came from the amazing activity and, and creative outflow <laughs> of the Index Card RPG and Drunkens and Dragons communities and just 
how much energy people are putting into this lifestyle of ours day by day. And for those of you out there neck deep in all this stuff, you know it's more than a hobby. It really is a way of being. And the RPG mainframe, I hope, has been a constructive, informative, and inspirational piece of that lifestyle. And for all of you guys for supporting it and making it possible, getting us all the way to 50 freaking podcasts. It, it's just holy mazzoli. I can't believe it. it. It feels so cool to be sitting on 50 podcasts just as a body of work. Now, not every one of them is as good as every other, but... You know, when you set out on, you know, let's say being a podcaster, <laughs> that's a really daunting and almost vapid goal. It's like, what does that even mean? But then to look back on 49 episodes and be recording this 50th one, to watch the waveform forming as I speak, it's really exciting. Okay, so for episode 50 of the mainframe, we're going to get right back into the, the beating, thrumming, clicking heart of Runehammer and and of this brain trust that we are all building together. And that is the cognitive science in our hobby and how knowing about it and understanding it might give us access to some of the deeper levels that we're looking for. Now, what I mean by deeper levels is like all of us who are fascinated by role-playing and by creating game designs and by living in fantastic story worlds, all of us are unified by this sort of aspirational drive, right? We want, we, we have a sort of vision in our minds of what the most fun could possibly be, the coolest sensation, you know, that, that sensation when you get a tingle that runs down your spine or you can't go to sleep after a session because the ramifications and consequences of what happened are so exciting or the emotional content of an uh, RPG session is so real and visceral, you tell stories about it for years to come. In the interest of that, that deeper satisfaction, those deeper levels, as I mentioned, I really believe that an understanding of cognitive science and its very specific application to the activities we do as part of our hobby, I think it, it unlocks some of those deeper levels. And so for the, the 50th episode podcast here, I really want to get back to that core. I, I love thinking about this stuff and more so learning about it. I think cognitive science isn't something that's easy to just sit and ponder. It's not like um, your next character that you're going to roll up, right? You can sit and open your heart up to a new character idea and see what's there and think upon it, whether you're grocery shopping or hiking or maybe you're sitting in the backyard by the campfire and you can start to see these new details emerging. Cognitive science, however, is more based in research and in, in, you know, actual doing of meat and potato science. So it can be hard to just intuit on your own. And so for me, I have to sort of go out on these research projects and they can be daunting at first. You know, like after two or three internet articles on almost any topic, your eyes start to sort of cross <laughs> and you start to see how large topics can be and you... You feel maybe I don't have enough data or maybe I already have too much data or like, oh my gosh, no wonder I didn't go into science in college, <laughs> right? But in this case, I had a, a pretty clear thesis. And with this thesis, I wanted to sort of embark on a journey of research. Now, I know that in the scientific world, this can be somewhat frowned upon, which is where you, you look for evidence to support a thesis rather than just looking for bodies of evidence and then, you know, having your theses be proved or disproven. You go at it with such a neutral approach, right? But I'm not a true scientist. I'm an artist really at heart and a writer. And so I wanted to share this sort of little journey with you guys. But most importantly, I wanted this journey and the evidence involved to affect the habits and the value people are placing on those habits in our sort of daily almost like the caloric expenditure that we use on our hobby. Like where exactly do we put our energy and why? And what does cognitive science tell us about the outcomes of those habits and those caloric sort of expenditures, okay? So that's kind of my my buildup and my intro to RPG Mainframe, episode 50. Episode 50 is basically the pen the joy of the pen. And, and I don't want to be equivocal in any way on this. I don't mean a pencil. I really do mean a pen. And what I want to do is talk to you guys about why 
for the 50th episode of a digitally delivered <laughs> audio podcast in the 21st century. The focus of my 50th thing here is the pen, the humble ink pen. So my thesis really here is quite simple, and it's that the pen and the paper is the lifeblood of this hobby. I think almost even more so than dice, which are like very closely in second place. The dice give us that randomization that leads us to new places, right? But this is a bit of a different topic. The pen and the paper is truly magical for the RPG hobby. Not just because of something like, you know, calling out to like the roots or, or the old school or sort of how it began. Not even calling out to, you know, drawing and, and a lot of what it has to do with the hobby, because I really do think it's central. You know, other forms of fantasy and storytelling media are not nearly as focused on drawing to me. Like drawing is just absolutely core, but that isn't really why I, I think that the pen is so important. The reason that I want to say that it's truly important is that it actually uses different parts of our brains that are the parts of the brain that make this hobby. And then there's a little extension I'd like to place at the end of the podcast about what to do with that sort of brain horsepower that I think in a lot of ways, and it seems like the evidence might be helping me out here, is this sort of the access or the gateway to the really the finest level of the RPG hobby. So now, as far as evidence goes, like the research that I did really can be sort of boiled down into three uh, little pieces that really resonated with me. You know, there's a lot out there. And I don't think uh, the research about the value of pen and paper behavior of, you know, writing in longhand, as it's generally known, I don't think that research is terribly new or controversial, but I don't think that reduces its value in any way. There's just a lot out there. But three pieces really resonated with me, and I just wanted to share them with you guys. The first is an often quoted article by Pam Mueller and uh, Daniel Oppenheimer. They're from Princeton and UCLA, working in cognitive science. And they did all these studies which compare the retention and synthesis capabilities of college students in two groups, one using laptops and one using handwritten notes during lectures. Now, I think it's sort of general... Um, a modern understanding that handwritten notes can lead to better comprehension of material, but to actually scientifically study it is relatively recent. This was uh, 2014 that this study came out. And in some ways it was like a definitive study. I think uh, it's, it's easy to say, well, you know, laptops have all these other advantages for students. That's absolutely true. But we're just talking about specific synthesis, comprehension, and retention capabilities. Now, Mueller and Oppenheimer, as you are probably guessing, spoiler alert, discovered that students using pen and paper had a far superior sense of retention and more importantly, comprehension of the material. And this is for obvious reasons, right? We can all visualize the difference. With a laptop, you're speedily cruising along. You can reformat. You can even take verbatim notes sometimes if you're a quick typist. And then you can easily reference things later, right? It's very useful and very modular. Whereas the pen and paper note taker sort of has to wait. You can't really write more than 20 words in a quick note, right? And so you need to wait for this lecture material to go and then really quickly get a note on it. And then later you might be referencing your notes and you don't have this nice, robust, reformatable Ver verbatim version of your lecture, you have a somewhat cryptic <laughs> set of notes, right? And everyone who's ever been a game master knows this feeling. You have all these notes when you're in this creative fugue, right? And you get all this stuff down on paper and then you're in your game session and you look down and on your, your book there, it says like 1D4, tail, fire shock, stone. And you're like, what the hell does this mean? And everybody's like waiting for you to do your, your turn and you're looking at your notes and they realize you have a blank expression on your face and they're like, he is just making stuff up right now. <laughs> now, at first, this seems like a real a disadvantage for the pen and paper note taker, but what Mueller and Oppenheimer's study revealed 
is that all these so-called shortcomings of pen and paper actually lead to the using of a different type of brain, which is the more synthesis-oriented brain and the more comprehension-driven brain rather than just memory. So we all, I think, acknowledge that you feel those sensations when you're using pen and paper rather than a laptop. And this isn't even to get into the distractions that a laptop can provide. But the more interesting part then is that retention or memory is the final sort of bottle to get shot off the log in this study, which is that laptop users had a far more detailed retention of material, factual level, like just, you know, being able to recall within the first 24 hours. And then after that had a steep drop off. Whereas the pen and paper user had a slightly lower retention in the beginning, but then held that retention for a very long term. Actually, the study didn't go long enough to find a meaningful drop off. And so this is like, whoa, this is fascinating. So even your badly written DMs note <laughs> about your dragon tail mechanics will stick with you in a more robust way if your game session is more than one day away even than the most detailed notes about your dragon tail attack done on a laptop. And then I would actually like to throw a quick little hanker and fur nail piece on the end of this, which is that it's far cooler to look at your pen and paper notes, even if they're bad, <laughs> than to look at your laptop notes. It's just plain cool. You have that feeling, which to me is one of the core fantasies of our hobby, which is feeling like an old sorceress looking at her book of secrets. So that's the study by Mueller and Oppenheimer. It clearly says like, wow, pen and paper, thumbs up, <laughs> right? So the second one I'd like to move to is Cindy May was writing about this study a couple, uh, I don't think, about a year later, 2015, and quoted their study a little bit and then sort of went on to discuss why this may be. Mueller and Oppenheimer's study was purely data gathering. And then Cindy May really wanted to push it further and say, why is this like this? I'm not just going to take it. I want to think about why. And her analysis was uh, published in Scientific American. And she basically described all of it and summarized it toward the end in her thesis as what she called mental lifting. And mental lifting is this sort of sweat effort. And actually, Victor Diaz mentioned this when I uh, met him down in Arizona at Rincon in his great talk about bullet journaling, too. There is an amount of effort involved with pen and paper that makes you remember. So here, here's another example that I could have for you. Imagine if you get in your car and zoom over to 7-Eleven to grab a soda and then zoom home. Okay, now as a counterexample, imagine that you walk over to 7-Eleven and grab a soda and walk home. Now we're imagining that it's quite close. It's a quick little hop across the block to go to 7-Eleven. And to me, the walking is the far richer experience. Now, not all of us have time to walk to 7-Eleven to get a soda, right? <laughs> but if you do, and I don't think anyone would uh, readily argue with me on this, it's quite nice to walk over and grab a soda at your local convenience market. It's quite nice. It's a nice little experience. It's a little treat for yourself, right? Whereas driving feels like, oh, I don't really have time to go get a soda. I got to zip over there. I got to zip back. It's just another micro commute in your day. And I think this same kind of thinking and this same value we place on what Cindy May calls mental lifting or just lifting in general, it gives us wealth. It gives us wealth in life to work for small things just a little bit. Not so much that you have a negative association because then you get the cortisol going in your brain and then you just got mental poopy pants and you're just, you're out of my, my fun picture. <laughs> but a little bit of work is just enough to give us those extra reinforcements which make things more rich. And this was Cindy May's thesis of why this, different exists, this difference exists between the pen and paper note taker and the laptop note taker in the aforementioned study. Now there's one more quote that to me is fascinating and perfect. So there's a, a, a large amount of data on this subject, but I really, when I'm doing research, I like to key in on people who like find that wording that nails it. And usually it's like two or three words out of all this research where they bring it all down and they just say, this is bah. And for me, in this case, on this topic, Nobody says it better than Robert Bjork, um, and he is a cognitive psychologist who's done a lot of work in, in sort of different publications. But he analyzed this phenomenon, also asking the same question, why is pen and paper so magic? 
And what he came to was similar to Cindy May's thesis, which he called it, and I love this, desirable difficulty. That's what he called this sort of phenomenon in the cognitive brain. Well, I guess the entire brain is cognitive, right? Well, except the lizard part. That's not cognitive. That's just like, <laughs> that just makes you have to go to the bathroom or something. There's not a lot of cognition going on. So not the entire brain. But Robert Bjork calls it desirable difficulty. And to me, especially for the RPG hobby, this is where we really get a useful term when we're discussing this. Now, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times this discussion will come up about using tools at the tabletop. Now, this can either be using your iPad with auto-filling your character progression. So you just hit level up and then it'll give you prompts and you can level your character up, right? You can do that. Or you can use your iPad to track your notes. Or perhaps you use your phone to calculate your damage when you swing your great club. Things like this. And tools at the table becomes a frequent discussion in our hobby. And it is then extended by the discussion of virtual tabletops. And maybe this discussion is becoming more frequent because as the hobby grows, I do think virtual tabletops are being employed more. So the topic comes up quite frequently. And to me, desirable difficulty is such a useful term when speaking meaningfully with others about the sweet spot for tools and virtual tabletops in our hobby. Now, what do I mean by that exactly? Desirable difficulty, if you guys believe the evidence that I'm presenting and want to go out on the internet and confirm it, if you agree with me, you'll see that desirable difficulty is actually where we want to be as hobbyists, as creative people, as smart thinkers, as retainers. Like retention of material in RPGs is such a huge part because it saves time. It makes improvisation consistent. It like adds all these really rich elements to what we do as role players. And so if you agree with me that desirable difficulty is a good thing, you now have a stance to meaningfully discuss digital tools, automation, and advanced automation in virtual tabletops, which has really become quite a popular trend. A lot of times the uh, response that I see coming up with automation in virtual tabletops is like, oh, well, your system must suck if you need all this automation. And I think that's just coarse and that's just mean. <laughs> I don't think that's really a viable argument. I think that's just a way to push others down. Let's acknowledge that some role-playing systems do have some somewhat intricate math to them. That's what makes them, some of them cool, right? I mean, that's it's fun. It's fun not only to do, but to learn. To say that automation is a nice thing to use doesn't just say, oh, well, you need automation then. It's just a crutch. No, 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 no. That is just a straw man. I don't like it. It's a slippery slope to where you just wind up saying everything is terrible because automation is nice. <laughs> no. Your nice argument or response now when you hear about automation in virtual tabletops or at the table using tools is, well, I think those things are probably great. But there's always an amount of desirable difficulty in our hobby. And if that's completely removed, yeah, I actually think that could be bad for your experience. And not bad because, well, this isn't fun, but bad because it's going to reduce your retention. And even more importantly, it's bad because it's going to reduce your synthesis and your comprehension. And let's face it, we have a complex hobby intellectually. There's a lot of parts and pieces. And the more that you master, the better you get at improv, the faster your turns go, and the more you focus on the real guts of the game, which is loving your friends. <laughs> so comprehension and synthesis are so clutch. And so a little bit of desirable difficulty is your friend. And now I want to come to a couple of more pieces of evidence that do not come from studies but they come from us. They come from our collective knowledge of our hobby. And I hope you guys are just right there with me because these feel self-evident to me and very, very strong arguments for why your pen and your paper should never, ever leave your hobby sort of routine and, and the core of what you do as you create characters, adventures, campaigns, and monsters. The first one is the joy of the worn out character sheet. The worn out character sheet covered in scribbles and things crossed out. And I said crossed out, not erased. Remember, this is a pen culture. The crossing out of a thing when it's lost is a visceral feeling and it's also a visual record. 
The crossing out of a stat when it goes up and the stat written next to it is messy, yes, but it's a reminder of all you've been through and all the growth you've undergone. The worn out character sheet has pieces torn off of it. It has post-it notes stuck on it. The, the, the portrait has been scribbled over and an eye patch has been added. The treasure section is such a gigantic mess. There's actually a curly arrow that points to the back of the sheet where you've written all the other things that your character is carrying around or that their servant who has a wagon is carrying. All these little joys to me are a big part of the fun of our hobby. It's having that worn out piece of paper in your hand, no matter whether you're playing on a virtual table or at home with your friends or in the game shop, that worn out character sheet is an artifact that is fun to handle and a joy to look at. And it's even more fun for others to see like, oh my God, that character has been through hell. And then, of course, we all know about destroying a character sheet, right? When there's a permanent character death and the real and visceral pain of destroying that beautiful, worn out character sheet that you've had for so long. That's another aspect of it. So to me, the worn out character sheet is another argument. Don't let pen and paper slip out of your game, no matter how digital you may be becoming. Then this is a little more esoteric, but there's a point I would like to bring up called the lovely mess. And this is a little bit about the worn out character sheet, but it extends into the game master's domain. The game master to me is the owner of this lovely mess. And I know that all of you have seen it at the table. Sometimes it can reach titanic proportions. And this maybe is an argument for using a DM screen, but there are index cards, there are post-it notes, there are dice, there are tokens, there are torn out pieces of paper with those annoying little spiral things on the left. There are miniatures, there, there are, you know, pieces of string that are dangling inside of a journal as bookmarks. Like the, the lovely mess is completely cleaned up by digital tools. Let's face it. I can have a Google doc that is my characters, my NPCs, my monsters, my mechanics, everything all in one searchable hyperlinked masterpiece. But without the lovely mess, I feel like once again, we miss out on this desirable difficulty. The ease of jumping around takes away some of the synthesis and the improv. Have you ever had this happen when you're game mastering? A moment comes up where a question is asked and you don't want to take the time to fluff through or leaf through your journal or to pick through your index cards to find the post-it note where you wrote the thing down and so you improvise it. And then upon that improvisation, things go a new direction you hadn't seen coming, much like the effect that a dice roll can have. With a perfectly hyperlinked and organized Google Doc for your adventure, this doesn't happen. Someone asks a question, you pop right down to the data, it takes you a microsecond, there's really no reason not to look at it, and there's your answer. And to me, the table just lost a little tiny drop of blood for that. The desirable difficulty led you to a new place, and new places are exactly what we seek in this glorious lifestyle of ours, is going places that we we did not foresee. That's the difference between the hobby of the RPG and reading and writing novels. Novels go where the writer takes them. But the RPG, there are dice. You never know where it's going to go. And for whatever crazy reason, this is the thing we love in our storytelling. And the lovely mess of the game master takes you there. It can help take you there. And so it should never be abandoned for tidy, clean, automated tools. Now, finally, and this is my sort of my big, you know, This is my big Zangief spinning suplex move for the podcast right here. Wow, Zangief appeared in the RPG mainframe. What the? (laughs) the? Get out of here. (laughs) Go back to Street Fighter, you weirdo. You don't belong here. (laughs) I mean, at least I'd rather just stick with E Honda. Ooh, oi, ooh, oi. That's where he sits on you. It's like, I think it's medium punch. Anyway, minor digression there. My big thesis for the desirable difficulty of pen and paper and why we really should do everything we can ha- we can to hold on to it as the core of our hobby, not just something that's a part of our hobby, the core of it. When you start a new character, you take the cap off your pen and you begin writing on a piece of paper. When you log on to your virtual tabletop, you open up your journal and you get your pen out and you get ready to play. Why? Why is that even higher 
than the dice in my estimation of the MVPs of our hobby or the great artifacts that make this the fun that it can be. Why? This is my final huge statement. Automation and advanced tools can be great for helping us with RPG rules, right? And especially if you're playing something more advanced, or maybe you're like far into your character and there's a lot to work on, right? I mean, you have a lot of spells, you have a lot of calculation when you're doing your Berserker Rage, you you have a lot of different caveats on your animal show, uh, form and so on and so forth, right? Or maybe you're a, a game master who's running lots of enemies or a spell casting enemy that's very complex and automation is very handy to you, especially when it comes to rules analysis and th synthesis. Right? A lot of people I know use digital core books on their phones, perhaps, with hyperlinks to jump around for rules. Now, I'm not going to be so silly as to come out and say, that's bad. You don't want nice automated rules referencing. Of course you do. It's great. It's 2019. Let's get into it, right? But, but, I would argue that the desirable difficulty of taking rules notes with your pen and paper not only gives you the retention of those rules like Mueller and Oppenheimer described in their article, it gives you the desirable difficulty which gives you the, the richer experience of those rules. But we've already talked about those things. My final thesis is that nothing makes a better RPG rules engine than your brain than your brain. No outcome told to you by an automation tool of any kind is ever going to be as good as the way that you accidentally or improvisationally interpret that very same rule. Because in interpreting, you, you will internalize it, you will simplify it, you will clean away the sharp corners, you will do it with less text because of sheer efficiency, and you'll put it in language which is comfortable for your table. Reading out of rule books can feel very cold and emotionless. But having a note on how a rule works and then recalling that in yet a third form of words, almost a game of telephone with yourself, to your players, has processed it now three, thrice over. The rule has become an organic living thing by being processed by your pen and paper, by your memory, and by your speech. But if we have an automated tool that just gives you the rule in a single tap, and there it is verbatim as the rule books say it, to me it's a colder, less processed, less, less you know, spaghetti like mama used to make it kind of thing. <laughs> as I said, I'm not a scientist. I'm an artist. So to me, I don't necessarily need like a scientific slam dunk at the end of this podcast to say the human brain processes and reprocesses RPG rules in a superior fashion because of XYZ evidence. No, I can't give you that. All I can look to are the studies about desirable difficulty, as Robert Bjork described it. In this case, that difficulty is jotting down the rule. Let's say it's the rule about how opportunity attacks work, right? It's easy to write a page or more about the various possibilities with opportunity attacks. There's a lot to be talked about. Pathfinder 2nd Edition does a great job at this. It's like it broke it down into terms that are like the first half of a sentence that help game masters describe the conditions of an opportunity attack. But you, don't, you can't write two big pages of nicely organized notes about opportunity attacks in your journal. That's just going to take forever. You have two little lines. And then when a player asks you, ooh, do I get an opportunity attack here? You look at it quickly and then tell them something else. You don't even read it out of your journal. You make another leap of synthesis. To me, this is the ultimate way that the human brain processes RPG rules and improves them with every single session and every step removed from the source material. There was a great comment came up on the Immortal Discord recently um, that, uh, you know, I try to never have books at the table unless we have a real dispute going and then a book can come out. And, and I really agree with that because of this type of processing. I've processed the rules in my way and I'm going to reprocess them yet again to help communicate them and teach them to you guys. And in turn, my players might be teaching me rules and reprocessing them. Geez, I hope so. That's the group you want to hang with. <laughs>
and this is my final argument about the value of pen and paper. Now, I might be preaching to the choir in some ways to you guys who may already be living that pen and journal lifestyle. I know that when I post my journal pictures on Twitter, there's always a wonderful, a wonderful response of people posting exactly what they're working on at that moment as well. And so I don't think I'm proposing let's reinvent things. I think a lot of people are already in there. The purpose of this podcast was twofold. To one, to reinforce that behavior, to push everybody to say, I know that automation is out there, especially when it comes to virtual tabletop. You know, they've automated character sheets. They've automated damage stuff. They've automated initiative and all these other things. But it is actually drawing some of the blood out of our hobby when they automate things because of this desirable difficulty, because of retention, comprehension, and synthesis. I am partially saying that, reinforcing. But I'm also doing this for the 50th RPG mainframe because there are few things to me that are more Runehammer than the pen and paper journal way of doing our hobby. Even for your characters, the, the, the character sheet has basically slipped out of my toolbox. I know that it's a core part of all of our games, but I just have my own shorthand for writing my characters now. And I love that. It, it, it give, makes them mine. It personalizes them for me. But more so, those of you who have tracked my creative evolution since I was Drunkens and Dragons all the way to today, to me, this is the thread that binds it all together. My most watched video is all to, of all time is Drunkens and Dragons world building in which I present my journal to the camera and it has the autofocus is too slow to fully focus on every page that I'm showing. It's a, a technical disaster, honestly, but I think it's at about a quarter million views, which is a big deal for me, but you know, isn't that many for some other channels, but for me, that's a lot of views. And it really is just saying, look, I world build by just sitting down with my journal and drawing a little cave from a side view and just seeing what happens and where my pen wants to go. I don't erase. If I want to change my mind, I scribble and change. And those scribbles help to reinform me and resynthesize that creative work. And the, the, the pen reaching the paper is almost like the ink is being indelibly written into my RPG brain. And even if my... My journal, like, I don't know if I, you guys saw this story long ago, but my journal fell out of a canoe. <laughs> yes, that really happened. And I very quickly yanked it up out of the lake, but a large portion of my journal was destroyed. But I had written those things in pen in such a way, it didn't feel that tragic. It was all still up there. When the pen meets the paper, to me, it's almost like the pen meets your stinking brain, only that would be somewhat painful. It feels like writing on your brain. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why I'll never be a scientist, because those are the kind of concepts that really resonate with me. Ink does not erase easily from the human brain. <laughs> you start rubbing it with your finger and like you're losing memories and stuff. <laughs> okay, so that's why I wanted to just talk about pen and paper. To me, it's just this, this huge thread that has linked me from the very beginning of sort of being publicly, publicly into this hobby to today. Pen and paper and the magic of how desirable difficulty actually makes us smarter, more creative RPG players. So I hope that this has been informative and inspirational for you guys and gives you that fun and excited feeling of cracking open that journal and getting those bullets written down without even knowing what you're going to write next to the little scribbled circle and beginning to fill in those bullets drawing rooms that you may or may not ever play, drawing characters that may be NPCs or maybe heroes, who knows, conjuring up new monsters and new worlds that may or may not reach the table, but doing, doing so to build this visual and written language that becomes your RPG engine inside your brain. And that, my friends, can never be automated. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and thanks to you for your ongoing support of Runehammer, and welcome to all the new patrons who have joined the mighty shield wall here in northern Runeham area. You guys are truly appreciated. Please feel free to join this conversation, whether it's on the Runehammer forums, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Patreon, or even in the Discord Immortal chat channel. Just be vocal. Bring your creations to the table and share and it is going to be another great month of creating RPGs 
for all of us here in Runeham area. So thanks everybody for tuning in. This is old Ingrid Burn all your buddy. I got to get on out of here. There's a lot to do today, so I'll see you all on the internet, all right? Strength, honor, and beer. I'm out.